Good morning, church. Wow, it's, uh, it's great for the church to gather together to worship our Lord. Uh, so honored to be with you today. It's been about three years, I think. Uh, so it's, it's been good to, to be able to reconnect with some of you, to be able to come and hang out and, and uh, just be a part of your worship experience. Thank you for that. Thank you so very much for that. Today, if you would, take your Bibles and turn to the book of Romans. Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, and we're going to be looking simply at verses uh, 1 and 2. Probably a familiar passage. Paul deals a lot with, with grace and with law in the book of Romans. Uh, but not only does he deal with grace and law, he... He really talks about what the gospel really is. Uh, have you ever thought about what the gospel really is? Um, how, when it comes to the gospel, what do you think about guilt? That's really kind of where I want to go today. The gospel and guilt. Have you ever been guilty before? You ever felt guilty before? Like, whoa. We'll never let go. Yeah. If you would stand with me in reverence to God as I read from his precious holy word. Stand in respect to God as I read from his word. Romans chapter 8 verses 1 and 2. It says, There is therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the spirit of life has set you free. In Christ from the law of sin and death. May God bless his word. Let's pray. Almighty God and gracious Heavenly Father, as we come to you. God, as we just come to you here this morning to worship you. God, to worship you just because of, of who you are. God, of, of your greatness. And God, I must admit that there are times that, um, that we create little gods in our lives, that we create idols in our lives. But God, here this morning, we confess that there is no God like you. And Father, we thank you for the grace that you give us. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for your love. Father, we thank you that you're such a sweet God and, and that God within you that we can have joy and that we can delight in you. And we thank you for that. Father, I'm so grateful for everyone that's gathered here today. And I pray, God, that, uh, you, would just, that you would just challenge all of our hearts that you would challenge our mind, that you would challenge our thinking. And God, for me today, I'm, I am just a sinful man. I'm just, I'm just an old sinful man. Uh, that God, that, that you have redeemed, that you have reconciled. And God, I pray today, Lord, that you would, that you would not allow this messenger to get in the way of the message. And that God, today, that, that you would be the one who would get all, all the glory and Father, we'll never fail to give you the honor and the praise. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You may be seated. You know, since last being with you, uh, one of the things I had to deal with was cancer. I don't know. Uh, probably everybody in this room, you may have had cancer or you know someone has got cancer. But I've had to deal with cancer. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, some. Uh, it had been well over a year ago that I got a call about maybe be able to come and speak. And I was still, uh, at that time, I think, dealing with some chemotherapy. And so I went through like two, two rounds of chemotherapy, a round of radiation, and also two surgeries. And so one of the things that, that, that I would do, I would, I would go and, and I would be infused with my chemotherapy like every other Tuesday. But I would leave on Tuesday afternoons and I would be on a chemo pump. And so I would come home and with this chemo pump and uh, uh, I have a man cave. Okay. 
And so I, w- I would set out in my man cave and I would read uh, and think through some things. I would ponder um, and just spend time there. And, uh, and as a result of that, I you know, just was able to, to do a lot of reading and uh, social media. It's like, wow. And, and so I was sitting there and it was kind of interesting. All of a sudden... I got this Facebook message. It was not from a friend because I do kind of public Facebook. And it was from this person who said, I've been looking at your post. And and he said, it seems that through your post uh, that that you're, you're getting along okay. He said, but for me, he said, I've been diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. And hospice has sent me home, and I'm going to die. He said, I'm afraid. Well, he lived several counties over from me. And uh, and so I I shot my message back. I said, give me your phone number, or here's my phone number. You know, we need to talk. And so he sent me his number. I called him. And... I called him, and we talked a little while, and I said, uh, I said, dude, uh, where do you live? And he told me. And I said, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll be over there Thursday, but I'll still have my chemo pump, if that'll be okay. And uh, we'll sit down and talk. And so two days later, I went over and spent some time with him. We met that morning. An interesting story. He told me, he said, I am afraid to die. I said, help me understand that. I said, you know, I said, you know, we all enjoy our life and family. If you ever had cancer hit you in the face, you work through that pretty cool. And I pray that you work through it with the gospel. He said, and listen to this. He said, years ago, my wife and I had this little boy. And he said, this little boy was the joy of our life. And he said, one day on his bicycle, he went out of our driveway and ran into the highway and was killed by a car, got ran over. And he said, you know, I just got so angry, I just got so mad, I got so upset with God. He said, I even cursed God, I even cussed God. That any kind of God that would do that would, there's no love or anything about him at all. He says, now, I feel so guilty. I said, guilty? He said, yeah. I feel guilty for what I did. And he even said, and you know, now I even think that maybe God's getting me back. So anyway, we, we, had, we had good conversation. We had good dialogue with that. And we worked through the gospel with some things. You know, it's really important to work through the gospel with things. And he, he, he made peace with God. So he had peace with God and peace of God, and he died a day later. You know, it's, it's really kind of strange when we think about what guilt can do. Notice what the Apostle Paul said. He, he said, he says here in the Scripture, he says, There is therefore no condemnation. Hey, have you ever had somebody kind of like just, just all of a sudden condemn you? Or maybe, maybe you did something wrong. How does that make you feel? It almost makes you feel like, whoa, I've just so been just knocked down. I just really don't know what I'm going to do. It's like all of a sudden I feel so guilty. Have you ever did something in your life? 
And it's kind of like, man, I screwed up so bad. I just messed it up so bad. I just made like a mess of that. I just can't believe I did that. And you never, ever let go of it. You ever been like that before? Well, here, I have. I have. Okay. And you walk around carrying guilt. You know, when you really think about condemnation and, and placing it in the context of what Paul was talking about here to the church at Rome, which was a church that was very persecuted, it's an idea that the condemnation is just not from someone, but maybe even from God. Uh, you know how it is. Uh, in the religious world, it's the idea that it, when it comes to, to religion, basically all religion, it's the idea that, that you need to believe first, and then you need to behave. You need to, like, get it all right. You know what I mean? It's kind of like you need to behave, and then you can belong to God. You know, all religions kind of believe that. And yet, you know what? And people who really don't believe in any God really are the same way. Because they're both trying to say, I want to be in control of my life. And it really don't work that way. Can you really be in control of your life? You know, it was in the Jewish world that, that they had their, their moral law. Uh, they had ceremonial laws. There were even animal sacrifices. And so, when Paul was talking about no condemnation, if you kind of read on up to Romans chapter 8, you hear him talk about Jew and Gentile a lot. You see, the very essence of what we're talking about with the gospel is Jesus. Jesus. It's not the idea that it's not the idea that I have to believe and then behave and then belong to the family of God. No, no, no. Or even 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 to be adopted and placed in this family. It's the idea that that by grace through faith I believe and then I I belong. And then there is behavior, but that's what I want to get to. I want to spend time on that. You know, I don't know, I don't know if some of you have ever experienced this before, but, you know, I, Nana, that's kind of what I call my wife. We, we all call her Nana. You know, like, she, she's like a hot Nana. She, you know, if you've seen pictures on her Facebook with the bald head, she is like, whoa, she's a hot-looking Nana. Okay. And she'll say, honey, you want some oyster stew? I'll go like, yeah, I love oyster stew. Well, if, if you'll go get some oysters, I'll, I'll make some stew. And so there's this place not far from, from where we live that they bring, well, they call them fresh oysters, but I don't really know. But a seafood truck comes by there, and so we'll get them, we'll come back. And so she'll put this big pot on, you know, she'll add milk, and there's butter, and it's like the oysters in there and everything. And then when we get a bowl and get ready to sit down to eat, she'll say like, you want my oysters? I'm going like, uh, sure. She'll say, well, I really don't like oysters, but I love the stew. I'm saying, well, like, then why don't we make milk and butter stew? You know, it's, it, it's, it's, it's really kind of like that. Because sometimes we, we really void the gospel. Oh, we would never say it, but we really void the gospel of Jesus. We take Jesus and who he is out of the picture. And we talk about the gospel. But, but the very essence of the gospel is all about Jesus. It has to be all about Jesus. If not, we, we kind of get confused. Before I had cancer, I'd go to the doctor, okay? I'd go pay the doctor a co copay. And I'd go in and he'd look at me and he'd say, you need to lose weight. Going well, like, okay. So all those years I paid my doctor to tell me I need to lose weight. Okay, after I had cancer, I lost 75 pounds. 
Let me tell you what, don't hit on that diet, whatever you can do. But now I go to the doctor and I pay the doctor a copay and he says, anything you want, you need to gain weight. I'm going like, help me understand this. I, I, I really kind of knew that myself, you know what I mean? But, but when it comes to the gospel, Jesus is the essence of it. And sometimes we, we kind of get that confused. We, we get it so confused that, that we live our lives simply connected into a church culture or trying to do behavior modification. It's, it's almost kind of like, well, we believe by grace are we saved through faith. We belong as many as receive him. He has made what? The children of God. But then all of a sudden, it's behavior modification. You ever thought about that? Now, what we try to do, we try to critique people's behavior. Or, or even worse, it's about our own behavior. And we need to understand that's not the gospel. As a matter of fact, what we need to, to understand that this is really a head-heart type of issue. That the idea basically happens like this. It's kind of like, well, you know, I know the Lord. He has saved me. He has placed me into his family. So now, what are the things I need to do to, to really get into a better standing with him? Know what I mean? It's like, well, you know, I, 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 really, I really need to do my devotions. But all of a sudden, your devotion become a checkoff list. I mean, do you really think I just married my wife for oyster stew? Come on. No. Or, or I need to be at church simply because it's a checkoff list. Because all of a sudden, if we don't do all of these different types of things, we begin to feel what? So guilty. And don't get me wrong. We need to spend time with God. Christian community coming together is, is so important. Worshiping together is so important. The scripture tells us we should do that. But what we need to understand, it has a lot to do with the motive of our hearts. We, we need to understand that, that when it comes to the gospel, there's nothing else that we can do to go beyond that. Any folks ever went to see Nut, Nutcracker before? You like that? Yeah, it's kind of like uh, down in Winston-Salem... Went to Salem School of the Arts, Stevens Center. They, they perform that every year. Boy, you better get your tickets like real early. You'll never get in. It's been like three and a half years since we've been there, you know. Anyway, you're able to go and you, you're able to see all of these people perform. I mean, beautiful artists, great artists. I mean, God has given them such a beautiful gift. And they're, they're in ballet. And man, to, to, to see how their movements, how it's choreographed, how... They're able to, to dance, and it's like, wow, it's unreal. And, and, and you leave there, at, at, at when everything is over with, it's kind of like, yes, this has been so good. Man, what a performance. You see, but most Christians feel... That they have to perform for God. That, that there's something in the way that, that if we can perform, then all of a sudden, it's kind of like maybe we can just get a little tighter, just get in a little closer to God. You know what I mean? If it's just something I can do, maybe it just kind of gives me a, a thumbs up. Maybe I, maybe I can just have one more step up than everybody else. Or, or maybe... I can't. So what does that create within us? When we, when we look at performance. Do you feel like you have to perform for God? In order for God to love you, do you feel like that you have to perform? 
Or how many times do we have a tendency that, that we will see our brother and sister who, who falls? And what we do, we, we, we look over our nose at them. Then all of a sudden we, we see this person who was struggling with prescription drugs or who was struggling with alcohol or who was struggling with pornography or who, who was struggling with, with sex or whatever it is. And all of a sudden, all of a sudden, as they had this struggle, all of a sudden they fall and it's kind of like the rest of the church and we have a tendency to look at them and say like, Oh no, look where they're at. And that's not what the gospel's about. Hmm. You remember Peter in the Bible. Uh, he, was, he was a hard head, head one. Quick tempered, like, whoo! Just quick. I mean, he would, it would take nothing to set him off. When you read it, it's like, whoo! It'd take nothing to set him off. I think it was in, I think it was in Acts chapter 10 that... That where God dealt with him about the Gentiles. And so all of a sudden in this dream, you remember he saw the spread come down? It was like this buffet on the spread, like, whew. And there were so many things there, like, yeah, God, just give me a dream like that. Make it real. Yeah, just, whoo. You know, kind of, wow. But then, then Paul looked at it, and, and there were things on that from his Jewish background, his Jewish heritage. And he said, I can't eat. Uh, that, that's unclean. That, that, that's totally unclean. Oh, I can't have that. You remember what God said to him? Peter, how can you call something unclean that I have made? So you remember, he goes to Cornelius. A Gentile, and he hears the gospel. Well, this same Peter, I think it's in, I think it's in the book of Galatians. Uh, Paul, Paul gives a story how that how that Peter went and and there was a gathering, there was a meal taking place, and and there were Christians there. There were Christians there who were Gentiles. Who, who believed, who had been saved by grace through faith and had been accepted and delighting in the Lord. And then there were Christians there who come from a, a Jewish tradition. I think he used the term the circumcised. And all of a sudden, the same Peter kind of slid away from the Hebrew Christians. I mean, from the Gentile Christians. As a, as a matter of fact, you know Barnabas, the encourager? He did the exact same thing. You, you know what sweet, sweet term Paul used for him? Hypocrite. <laughs> Hypocrite. As a matter of fact, the scripture even talks about how that the truth of the gospel was distorted. Listen to what it says in Galatians 2.14. It says here, but when I saw that their conduct, conduct was not in step with the truth of the gospel. In other words, Paul confronted Peter about that. You know, it's funny, it's kind of like, we know, by grace through faith, it's not of works. It's, it's kind of like, hey, then go ahead and keep the law again. Does that make sense? And I got news for you. There is none righteous against God at all. There's nothing, nothing that you can do. There's, there, 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 there's no act of service that you can do that will ever impress God about anything. Totally. But we have been made righteous in our righteousness is in Jesus Christ. Notice what, notice what verse 2 says there. And it says, for the law of the spirit of life has set you free. Christian, why are you in so much bondage? Why do you run around feeling so guilty? I have a friend of mine who was an officer. He went on domestic. And, uh, 
And he went to his neighborhood. So when he got through with the domestic that he had went on, he, he saw a couple of people in there that he knew. And, and one was a... Uh, one was the wife of his former youth minister years ago. And so he talks to her, and he, he, he told me, he said, I could tell something's not right. He said, Chaplain, he said, I, I gave her your number, said, I, I think that she just kind of really needs to connect, maybe talk something out. So here we go. So about two weeks later, she called me. She gave me her name. And she said, and called the officer's name, said, he told me that you would be a pretty good person to talk with. I said, well, I don't know about that. I said, at least I can listen. And so we, we met at Starbucks and hung out, you know, public place, good coffee. I kind of like those local grinds. Y'all like local grinds? It's like, man, it's like we got a place downtown with local grinds. It's like out of this world. They got like chocolate, homemade chocolate stuff I mean, let me get back to the story, okay? That got lost there for a moment. Well, anyway, we were meeting at Starbucks. And she, she started talking to me. I said, tell me a little bit of the story of your life. I love to hear people's stories. We all have interesting stories, don't we? Everybody has such an interesting story. She said, you know, I, I grew up in a home. And she said, uh, coming up in the home, I had been abused. There had been a, a stepfather involved, and she had been abused. So the thing in her mind was like, man, as soon as I can, I'm getting out of this home. I'm going to marry, I'm going to get out of this place, which is really kind of typical if you, if you, if you kind of minister or work in that situation. And she said, so, so I, I got out and said, you know, and that only lasted about a year. And said, all of a sudden, all of my life, all of my life, I said, if I could just find a man that has a love for God, then it'd just be okay. So anyway, she ends up marrying this dude, and he, he's a pastor, associate pastor. But long story short, she started realizing how the performance thing started working. And then not only that, her husband ended up having an affair with a lady who was the wife of an elder in the church. This was a humongous church. It was a big church. So anyway, she goes to the pastor and says, hey, you like need to help us. You know what this knothead did? I got other names I could use, but not use it here. It's probably being taped, isn't it? You know what he did? <laughs> he told her, he said, maybe if you could be more affectionate at home, this wouldn't have happened. Can you believe that? That, that, mm, that guy told this this, this lady who was, whose life had been torn apart, that it was her fault that her husband was having an affair. Help me understand that. And so she went back and she tried and she tried and she tried. Boy, everything that she would read, how to have a good marriage, how to do this, how to do that. She tried and tried and tried and tried and tried and tried. And you know what? It still didn't work. That dude ended up getting out of the ministry, has a bad porn addiction. Is an alcoholic. So she meets with me and she says, I am just through with this. She says, this God stuff, I'm just through with this. This religious, this church stuff, I'm just through with this. I said, whoa, 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 whoa. We, let, let's really talk about the gospel here. Don't throw Jesus out with the bathwater. Okay? So we started having a conversation about that. You know what? She had felt so guilty because what had happened, she had tried and she had tried and she had tried and she had tried and it was just not good enough. She was so discouraged because she had tried and she had tried and she had tried and it was just not good enough. 
Then she says, what the heck? This doesn't work. That tells us that she really had never understood the gospel where Jesus is the essence of that gospel. You know, for, for, for some of you who, like, are involved in sports, you know, some of you may, may run. Uh, my, my idea is that if God intended you for to run, he'd give you four legs like a horse. But, I, you know, I, that's just my opinion. But that's, that's just me. I, I don't mean it that. I mean, if you run, I think it's good. Man. You know, I, I, got, you know I, I think it's good that you run. But, but it'd be like one day that that you're running. And all of a sudden, this, 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 this best marathon runner, that she, she comes up to you, and you're there, you're struggling, you know, doing your best. And all of a sudden, everybody's just kind of running past you. As a matter of fact, like, as a matter of fact, the only thing behind you is the cop car with the blue lights on that's following the, the runners to keep somebody else running over you. But you finally cross the finish line. But the best runner comes up to you and says, here's my ribbon. Here's my award. I ran for you. That's what Christ did for us. I don't have to. I, I don't have to. I don't have to try to perform. You don't have to try to perform. It will like wear you out. And in reality, that's not the gospel. That's not true gospel. For you who feel like, man, I'm, I'm saved now. I've got to do all of these things in order to, to, to have, so that God will have a better view of me. Wrong! You will fail. But the scripture says that he who knew no sin, Christ, was made sin so that we would what? Become the righteousness of God. So it's beautiful the way that we live this out. So, you know, I love the nutcracker, but you know what I love better than the nutcracker? I, I love to see the performance. We don't have to perform before God. But you know, you know one thing I can't whack. When Nana gets through with, with taking her chemotherapy from, she has breast cancer now. My wife was diagnosed with breast cancer. She gets through with all that. You know, one of the things we used to do, we would go out and we would dance. Oh, man. Oh, oh. Just to be able to go out and dance, hold hands and to hold her and dance and hear her whisper in my foot, get off my feet, get off my feet. I mean, it was kind of like, it, it was that kind of thing. But you see, God don't want you to perform for him. He wants you to dance with him. He wants to lead. He wants you to dance with him. It's a beautiful dance. We should delight in the Lord. The gospel should take away all of our guilt. Hmm. When the fall happened, relationships were broken. Relationship with God was broken. Relationship with others was broken. And re your relationship with yourself is broken. And you know, you know really what that is, don't you? That is an identity issue. That created an identity crisis. Because all of a sudden what happened when the relationship with, with God that was broken is kind of like, Whoa, I want to be like God. But, but in the gospel, in the gospel, that has been restored to harmony. And so therefore, having a relationship with God doesn't mean a performance. I have to perform in order to have that relationship. That is fulfilled in Christ. That is fulfilled in the gospel. The relationship that was broken with other people, I don't have to manipulate people or I don't have to be manipulated. It doesn't have to do that. I don't have to look at people as a project. 
one of the things I do with, with the convention, we, we teach small groups and things of that nature. We talk about, talk, talk about engaging people with the gospel. People are not a project. Evangelism doesn't make people, you should, not be, you should not see people as projects. As a matter of fact, everyone that you see according to the scripture has the image of God within them. Everyone. It's just been marred by, by sin. Did you know that? Read the Bible. It's in the Bible. It's just been marred by sin. People are not a project. It's not like how many, how many have I reached. It's not about that. It's about people are important. So I don't have to have a, a running tab. But the image of God is in you. You're important. Oh, you're so important. God loves you. It's like, like oh, he loves you. More, there's no English, there, there's no dialect anywhere that could exaggerate God's love for you. Right on. It's so awesome. And then your relationship to yourself was broken in the gospel that is restored. I found people that's like, man, it's kind of like I'll marry this dude and or I'll hang out with this dude and I'll date this dude or I'll date this, the, 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 this gal or this girl or whatever. It's kind of like, man, that's where my identity is in that. Like, whoa. And all of a sudden, you know what? It could be taken away. Then where's your identity? Well, well, you know what? I'll place my identity, therefore, in what I have. And then get the phone call from the doctor that says, you need to come back and see me. You go see him in his office. He looks at you and he says, I'm sorry to tell you this, Mr. Hughes, but you've got cancer. And it's really bad and you may not live. What happens to that, identity, to that identity? Where does it go? Oh. <laughs> Me and Nana was talking, or you may sound like, you know, there's nothing wrong with like looking, looking good. You know, there's nothing wrong with like taking care of your name. Oh, that's good. But I still believe bodily exercise, prophets, little local recording, but never mind. You know, I just kind of think through that out loud. But we even try to put it in our looks. Huh. Walk with me once a week through the cancer center. Back where they're doing chemotherapy. Some of you may have walked there. Some of you may have walked with someone else there. And you look at people's faces. Hmm. Me and Nana was talking the other day. It's like, man, this chemotherapy makes you look old. I said, well, you still look hot. I said, I look old as dirt. I don't know about you, but I was like, whoa. But it does. The identity, the relationship with self is only restored when our identity goes back into Christ and in Christ alone. And in him alone, I don't have to perform. I don't have to try to work. I can delight in him. I can look at, at his goodness, at his mercy. To live in him, to die and to die to self. Oh, that is so hard to do. Because there's something about us that's always wanting to do. We have freedom. We have freedom in Christ. We have freedom in Christ Jesus, and 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 and, and that's what he's called us to do. One thing to love yourself is another thing to worship yourself. Two different things. So therefore, gospel and guilt. Now there's conviction from the Spirit. But I'm not talking about conviction from the Spirit. I'm talking about the guilt that we live in. And we never ever can let it go. Conviction of the Spirit can, can make us feel horrible. Because we've sinned against a God who loves us. 
who gave his son to save us. Wow. But there's nothing I can do to make that right with him because Christ has already made that right. So I just need to confess my sin. He's faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Wow. But to live in him. You know, it's really kind of interesting as, we, as we're kind of winding down here. You know, t- t- today we, people are sitting around and, you know, two things. There's one of two things that's happening with us today. We're either sitting here and we're delighting in the goodness and the sweetness of God. Or we're sitting here and we're feeling guilty. Because there's just something else you feel like you need to do to try to try to make it. You know, you know you're saved, but it's kind of like, can I kind of get a one up, you know? No. Your relationship with God is not about a task list. It's about an intimate relationship. We we all need to become Christian hedonists. We ought to sleep, we ought to breathe, we ought to, everything about us ought to be about Jesus and our love for him. Our love for him. But we kind of get stuck. Well, what are the ten ways that you can, that you can parent? If you'll do step one, step two, step three, step four, step five. You know, we, we, we kind of have all of these different things that we can do. Like it's going to make it better. Don't get me wrong. I, I think spiritual practices are so important. But you know what? Outside of the gospel, you don't have anything. Outside of the gospel, there's nothing at all. You see, our problem is we're always wanting to fix self or fix others. And we can't do that. As a matter of fact, we'll get discouraged and we'll feel guilty when we cannot do that. When it comes to the gospel, you need to realize that ever who you are in here, I don't care who you are, especially me, I am accepted by God in Christ. There's nothing else that can be added to that. Outside of the gospel, there's nothing else that can be added to that. It's impossible. There's nothing but the gospel. There's, there, there's, there, you, you cannot say Jesus plus works or Jesus plus task or Jesus plus this. It's only Jesus. You cannot add anything to grace by grace through faith plus nothing. So then we need to live that way. The lighting in the Lord. And may he receive glory and honor for that. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, today as we come to you, God, you know, it's, it's just so difficult. Uh, the, sometimes the way we've even been discipled or the way that we've been, 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 been taught or the things that we've heard or the things that we, we see, read about or hear about or read blogs or whatever, it's kind of like there, there has to be something else we have to do for you. In order to have a better standing with you. But God. That's impossible. Lord we need to serve you because we love you. 
Lord, we need to be about our Father's work because of our love for you, not because of, of trying to perform for you. So, Father, today, I think at times we all struggle with this. But being, but being really gospel-centered, centered in the gospel, centered in, in you, removes the guilt, removes the shame, and allows us to delight in you. And then all that we do in serving and loving it's all about our relationship with you. It's because we want to. Father, we, we no longer worry about breaking the laws of God because, God, we never want to break your heart. <laughs> Father, today I pray that you would just work in our hearts and our lives for your glory, for your honor. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, today, if you want to come up and let's have some conversation about that, we can. Or you just want to talk to the Lord about it. Whatever you want to do.